G'day guys, welcome to G-Man Speaks, and today I have a longer uh, story that has been sent in from one of my subscribers. So this story, the theme is a man's experience with women, from go to woe, from dating as a teenager to being married, then divorced. So guys, grab a drink, um, sit down, and enjoy the story. Hi G-Man, love your content. Keep it up. The young guys need to learn more than ever before. I am soon to be 51 years old. I've been divorced now for close to five years. As a young man, I was clueless when it came to the fairer sex. I come from a hardworking Maltese family in North Queensland. My parents are still married after 51 years. I was raised Catholic and my parents instilled in me a strict but fair sense of what it is to be a man. Treat your woman with respect, but be a role model. Work hard. Be honest. You know, all the blue pill bullshit. Hey, we're all taught that. <laughs> I went to an all-boys boarding school for years 8, 9 and 10 because we owned a large cattle station far away from many high schools. In years 11 and 12, I attended a co-ed Catholic private school. This was my first adolescent experience of being around girls. I know I was a good-looking young fella, girls, and not my mother, commented on it more than once. But unfortunately, I took after mum's side of the family and only reached 172 centimetres. My, my younger brother, on the other hand, is six foot three. I'm a smart guy, but was never classically nerdy. At school, I played rugby league, union, and had a lot of other sports. So at school, I had a lot of girlfriends. But I was too dumb to be able to read the signs of a girl that was physically interested in me. Plus the fact I was scared shitless to ask, lest I be rebuffed. You guys can probably attest to being obsessed with a particular hot Sheila and drooling all day over her, whilst ignoring the other still not bad looking chicks paying you heaps of attention. It never occurred to me that these girls were just as shy as I was. We had our prom in year 12, and after drinking way too much liquid courage at the after party and starting a fight between my footy team and one, of, and one guy from another school, I got to sweet talking a nice Italian girl that was in my English class. It was a real opener when other girls found out I had hooked up with this girl and all of a sudden, I realised there were several girls that wanted me. After a few dates and lots of second base stuff, blue balls bursting, she told me she loved me. That shocked me a bit, and I never told her the same back. A few weeks after school is over, we graduate. This little filly gets into university and proceeds to dump me like a hot potato. First lesson learned, don't believe a Sheila. Maybe it was because I didn't shag her, but for some reason, it never really bothered me getting dumped. I was, after all, mad on fishing and sports and spent most of my time doing these things in the following months when I wasn't doing my trade as a fitter and turner at a sugar mill. I hated clubbing and was only earning a piss all wage so I never really got out much to meet girls. From 19 and 20 I had a few encounters with some questionable monsters, not wife material, but I clearly remember thinking that I wanted to have kids early on in life and time was of the essence. I had finished my trade by 1995 and started working at my father's business as a machinist. There was this girl I'd met a couple of times after school that was going out with a total wanker that I had known in boarding school. She was gorgeous, petite and Italian. The only three criterias I had as a prerequisite and she was my age. I don't mow other people's lawns so I didn't ever give her the impression I wanted her. Then I found out she had gotten engaged, but she had broken it off a few weeks later. I thought, okay, wonder what happened there. Anyway, I bumped into her at the clubs a couple of weeks later. She was always pissed, two pot screamer, and all over me and any other guy within a 10 foot radius. Red flag guys, red flags screaming at me. I kind of ignored her at first, you know, but I gave her the full body hug, feeling the good bits, weighing it up in my mind. I was also usually pissed as on Bundy rum, but I remember thinking, man, this chick is way too hot for me. Then I found out from mutual friends that she liked me. Now, this is a game changer, guys. 
Now you know she is interested and it opens that door. You aren't afraid of being humiliated. I did a bit of due diligence, found out her parents were still married, how many siblings she has, where she lived, and what she did for a job. It all checked out. For me, Catholic upbringing, Caucasian mother, Italian father. Off the ship, as we call them. I was the only person out of my three future brothers-in-law that could understand him. And I don't understand Italian. And he spoke English to some extent. She had gone to a crappy state high school. That was a red flag, but that wasn't her fault. She had gone out with a few blokes, so more than likely had a bit of baggage already. But then again, nothing like today's standards. I cold phoned her one night, got the mother on the phone and asked for this filly to talk. She answers and remembered me, thank Christ, and I asked her out on a date. Nothing fancy, just a local bistro meal and to see the bad boys at the flicks. Good old bad boys, mate, you're going way back in time here. She didn't wear anything slutty, which was good. Plus, had I had her dimensions memorised. We got on like a house on fire, kissed her that night, and it was pretty much we were a couple the next day. I know. Weird, hey? I never even entertained the thought she might be stringing other guys along. As it turned out, she wasn't, so I dodged a bullet then. In hindsight, it would have been better to cop that bullet between the eyes than then. I found out later that some fat ugly prick that went to school with her reckons he nailed her when she was clubbing. So pissed or spiked drink or both, who knows. These things happen, I guess. She wanted me from the moment we went out, so I just thought, fuck it, she is mine now. Beginneth the nightmare. By the way, guys, I did pay for the meals and the movies. Call me a simp, but I'm a traditional guy. And this was 1995. Not a simp at all, mate. In the following weeks, we were inseparable. I would go to her place after work at about 6 and get home at midnight. It was exhausting, and this was before the smashing started. I put my trusty Holden Commodore VR sedan to good use that year, as you can imagine. Her having an off-the-ship, God-fearing father put the shits up me, ever getting caught with his daughter doing the wild thing at her place. Her mother caught me using the fingers on some southern exploration one time, but she just went bright red and walked out of the lounge. We'd been dating for about 10 weeks when I started to notice some really bad insecurity issues with her. When we were out, if another girl she perceived as being hot was near, she would get stuck into me about looking at her. I couldn't understand this because as far as I was concerned, why would she give a fuck? I was rooting her and giving her the attention she wanted in every possible way. Then it got worse. I loved The X-Files, which had been on air since 1993. The lead female actress in The X-Files, Agent Scully, played by Gillian Anderson, is a pretty smoking redhead. Now you like your milfs back then. So this girl of mine starts up about me having the hots for Agent Scully. And then I get banned from watching it. Well, in her presence anyway. It was pathetic. If a naked chick in a sex scene appeared in a movie we were watching, she would try covering my eyes. What the F? I even had to ask a hot salesman representative to stop coming to my dad's business. We would order by fax, I told her. I had never been exposed to this type of jealousy. Wasn't I supposed to be jealous of all the fuckwits trying to cut my grass every time we went anywhere? I used to just smile at these dickheads and grab my missus on her perfect ass as we walked past. These are the sorts of issues that never go away, guys. A huge red flag. How can a woman that is seriously as good-looking as this chick be so insecure? But they can be, and many are. We went steady for a full year before I proposed. She was ecstatic, as was her family and mine. I am the oldest of three in my family and the eldest of my cousins. My fiancé is the youngest of four girls. We were married a full year later in 1997 when I was 23. Leading up to our wedding, the sister of my fiancé got married, and I had a few run-ins with her. She had called me a little boy once, and I went and told her to fuck off, so I didn't get along with her. Anyhow, the night of her wedding, I thought I'd better do the right thing and give her a kiss on the cheek and congratulations. The sister didn't mind, but fuck did my fiancé. Huge fight later, I was hyperventilating with the effort I had to had to debate my fiancé about why I had the audacity to congratulate my future sister-in-law for getting married. The night before our wedding at the rehearsals, my fiancé was being weird and cold. 
After the rehearsals, I find out why. I get accused at perving at my fucking little 16-year-old sister who was a bridesmaid. <laughs> Jesus. The things my future wife said at this time, I cannot dare repeat, but let's just say they were fucking disgusting. Now this is my friend, now this, my friends, is the point where Caesar, in Roman history, pauses and decides on the pros and cons of crossing the Rubicon, the point of no return. I did this, seriously did this, and my gut, not my dick or my brain, was screaming at me. No effing way. I rang my mother. I rang my best mate and best man about my feelings. My mum never told my dad. It was my second biggest mistake to not to talk to dad about it. Guys, if you have a close relationship with your dad, he is your rock. Talk to him. I had a much more honest relationship with mum, and I thought as a young man, it was weak to show any insecurities. So I did as Caesar did. I crossed the Rubicon into married man life. I will say this was my biggest mistake. That is for later. Truthfully, what I did was this, and many have made this reasoning. I was with the girl of my dreams. Beautiful, sexy, caring, blah, blah, blah. Forget the insecurities. Forget the closet narcissism, which would bloom later on. I had too much to lose to not marry this girl. There was no one better out there. I was just a short, average guy living in a hick town. It would get better when I make an honest wife out of her. My mother-in-law has molded her into the perfect housewife, blah, blah, blah. Boy, was I wrong. Yep, we many men do that. Myself included, mate, so you're not alone. Like I said, we were married in 1997, June to be correct. My wife was beautiful. The ceremony went off without a hitch. One of my cousins shagged a bridesmaid in the bathroom of the venue. Speeches were made. Toasts were given. Most people there don't give two fucks and both our families pay shitloads for them to eat and drink and be merry. I remember saying my vows and fully meaning them. I remember signing the certificates not understanding that I had just signed over half of the wealth I was about to slog my ass off and earn for the next decades. We had a great first night at a swanky hotel and then jetted off to Vanuatu for the honeymoon. I can honestly say that married life was pretty damn good up until my first son was born in 1999. My wife and I built a new house, that we were, but, but we were broke afterwards, so we both knuckled down and saved. We even worked on the weekends as landscapers for cash to save up for things like a wheelbarrow so we could start our own lawn and gardens. None of this having everything from the get-go a lot of young people do today. I rode an old worn-out Yamaha XT175 to work, and my wife drove the Commodore to work. I eventually bought an old Datsun Ute to use for the yard and fishing. Life was sweet. The young married man's dream. Sex on tap, lazy Sundays sleeping in, no Nazi dad, love you dad, waking me up at 7am hungover to go spray crops or mow the acreage. As we got a little more breathing room with finances, we stayed at Early Beach for birthdays and wedding anniversaries. We had the internet and mobiles by now. In fact, my wife and I had both bought Motorola flip phones from when, we, from when we started dating. I still have my original phone number. We used to do a few things with other couples, but my wife didn't really like my friends. Big problem here, gentlemen. So we drifted apart from them. My wife didn't really have any close female friends, only work colleagues. Only if I found this strange, and I think I know why now. Women can sniff out bullshit. I thought it was because other women were intimidated by my wife's beauty. My mother and sister secretly didn't think much of her either. I now know that from watching G-Man that this is a thing. As we all say, beauty is skin deep. Hey, live and learn, boys. I want to press on how interactions between families can really put pressure on a relationship. My family has always been close. We are a traditional Maltese family that gets on and gets together often. My wife hated this. She was always saying, why can't your mother just leave us alone? And this, will provide, and this will proceed to insist that we do things on her side. Which, by the way, I had no problem doing. I had my opinion. I had married her family as well, and they are an Italian family. But they had been watered down by the Caucasian Aussie mother. I respected all of my in-laws and had known one of my brothers-in-law before I had met my wife. For our whole marriage, I never, ever refused to go to anything on her side, even when I was studying a degree later in our marriage. 
Unfortunately, this was never reciprocated with my family and I started to strain my relationship with mum and dad and eventually my little sister who I was really close to. When the children arrived, things went to a whole new level. My parents could only come over at certain times. Nobody could be sick, bullshit after bullshit excuses. Anyone with half a brain should trust people that have actually raised children before. But not my lovely wife. Oh no, she knew best. If she had exposure to Google like kids have nowadays, she would have been on that like flies on a cow turd, trying to justify every decision she ever made. It was pathetic. Caused a lot of grief between me and my family and caused fractures in my marriage. As the children grew, birthday parties with perceived schoolmates always warranted a big over-the-top party, but the gathering with the family was non-existent or a small affair. I hated having to find room for all the $10 Chinese crap the kids would give us in presents. Christmases were the worst. My family, as we all got more wealthy, would go away to Airlie or Hamilton Island for a week every second Christmas. We never, ever went on these. My wife always put her foot down, and we would either do our own thing or go to her side just for the day. My children never had the exposure to their first cousins or paternal grandparents that they should have had because of this. It is sad. I had a brother-sister type relationship with all of my first cousins, and we are all good mates today because of our great parents. In effect, my wife used our children as leverage against my family. In my opinion, this is a common theme with many, many women. Children grow up to be adults and they eventually understand the ramifications of this type of coercive control. This behavior was what drove me away from her in the months leading up to our separation. 17 years go by quick as a flash. Our children, two boys and a girl, are 19, 15 and 13. She decided that a vasectomy is the best family planning tool, and so I got nicked. Don't do it, guys. It fucks up your libido. We have been running our own business since buying out my parents in 2005 and are worth north of $2 million. Money is no object to my wife now. She spends and spends, and I work and work. I am in still good physical shape, mostly because I am a tradie and work hard, usually 10 to 12 hours a day. My wife isn't a fat ass. She has had three kids, but she hasn't looked after herself and only eats shit food, so she is starting to get a bit chubby. It doesn't bother me. We still have a bit of bedroom action once a week and always try really hard. I've already discussed the division between my family and my wife, and things have gotten much worse. The mental anguish is starting to bite here. I start to dread Christmas starting around October. I've become a shell of my former self. I started studying online in 2012 with a mechanical engineering degree, so my time is taxed to the max. I work and get no respect from my wife except things like, your employees do all the work, and all you care about is money, while booking another $25,000 holiday. <laughs> that is rich, mate. I come home, and I find my kids hungry. No meals ready. Luckily, I've learned to cook out of necessity, so I can whip up spaghetti pretty quickly from scratch. I run my children to dancing and gymnastics after work. Sometimes I get home at 8 p.m., shower, and study until midnight, usually falling asleep in front of a recorded lecture. At this time, I am conscious of the torment my actions have on my wife. I ask her to watch an episode of a favorite show she is watching now and then. I am put to the sword and forced to watch Orange is the New Black. <laughs> I am noticing, however, the women I love drifting away from me. I am just a doormat now, the provider of a gravy train. I start to realize this and imagine another 10 years, little old me being scolded by a big fat Italian wife shopping as I shuffle a few paces behind her mumbling, yes dear, as she tells me to wait outside the shops. <laughs> Fuck that, where are my balls gone? On weekends, I go alone to our beach block an hour north of our home, five acres right near the beach. I've bought a large fishing boat. My mates and I use it sporadically, but I bought it for the family. My parents have been to the beach block once. None of my siblings have for more than a day. My wife would never agree we should have Christmas as a family there, even though it had heaps of room for caravans and we have had a huge veranda for the meals. I'm getting it ready for sale. My wife wants to send our second son to a $50,000 per year school in Brisbane because he is good at sport. After many weeks of fighting, I stupidly agree. 
I have to sell the place we all love to finance this stupidity. I know that my son will drop sport once he gets there, but he eventually gets through two years of it. I would not ever hold that against him. It was me being piss weak that caused it in the first place. So as you can tell, gentlemen, I have all the money and the toys, but I'm not happy. I'm as far from happy as I've ever been, and he's about to get much, much worse. In 2016, we've been fighting a lot, much of it about her jealousy issues. Around mid-2017, I start to notice my wife getting cold. She doesn't talk much and seems distracted. She now has a smartphone, the worst fucking thing ever invented for a woman to use. A smartphone equals a dumb woman. I'm hanging out the washing one day, as I often do, as my lazy wife won't do it, and I notice all these G-strings. I confront her about it and get this response. I like wearing them now. <laughs> what bullshit. She never liked wearing them, even when she had a perfect ass, and then she would only wear them to initiate sex. She goes daily to pick the kids up from the most expensive private school in town an hour early. I found out that after we got separated, she was doing this to chat up a divorced simp that had had, had his kid there as well. The proverbial shoulder to cry on. I wish I had a bloke like G-Man to listen to at this time. Because if I did, it would have saved me a ton of money and much anguish. You see, even though I was a doormat shell of a man, that young blue-peeled kid was still holding on to hope that his wife still loved him and would never leave him. I brushed off seeing those G-strings and that bullshit answer and it was business as usual. The wife books another expensive bullshit holiday to Sydney for Christmas. By the way, this is after I dropped 65000 bucks on a new car for her and $53,000 on an in-ground swimming pool and tens of thousands on further house renovations. The holiday sucked. Sydney is a shithole. I find out from my mates that the missus spent most of her holiday Facebooking photos of our adventures to gloat without, most of me, without me in them. Yeah. Gee, that's rough, buddy. 2008 comes along. And one lunchtime, she just casually drops the, I want a separation bum on me. At first, I was shocked and then secretly relieved. I just calmly said, good, piss off then. <laughs> she did not expect that. I think she wanted me to plead with her to stay. As the days and weeks went by and I could revel in the peace and quiet, that quiet turned deafening. It was a kid, you see. I'd been with them from birth and now they were gone. Slowly but surely, my mental health started to plummet. She let me see them for a couple of days at a time, but it wasn't enough for a dad like me. I tried to be stoic. I ran my business. I smiled and spoke to people as I always did, but inside my mind was a cyclone. I started to realize just what was at stake, and unfortunately for me, I decided that I did not give two fucks about the wealth my two hands had created for us. I just wanted my family back. Once a solicitor, lawyer, shit started to turn up. I really cracked. To me, it was abhorrent. I hate family lawyers and always will. I put my head in the sand and refused to engage anyone about the shit. As most of your viewers that have gone through divorce court will know, they are absolute pricks. Vultures circling a dead carcass that is your marriage and your life. Yep, been there, buddy. I've been there. I can tell you all about it. They were both in on it. My lawyer and hers. They see a huge asset base and decide how to screw you over. This was before I had any idea of the bias towards women. Rational me thought, well, she left me. She never worked. She didn't contribute to our wealth by working. I paid both of us the same wage from the company, even though she did nothing in the company. Her super was equal to mine. All of this does not mean shit. Is 50-50 is the best you will ever get. As for the children in custody, that's a whole other shit storm. I fucked that all up and I'll tell you why. Guys, don't for a moment think you're invincible. Your thoughts can bring you down and fast. For me, once the shock had set in and I realized what my future was going to be like, my mental health deteriorated rapidly. My, my main reasoning was that I was a failure, a loser. I lost a good woman. I know what you're all thinking. I miss my kids. I miss my wife. My mates, seemingly sympathetic, don't really give a shit. I made a critical mistake in not confiding in my parents about how I felt, especially Dad. He would have rationally pointed out what and why, and I think I would have been okay. But I'm a man. I have to deal with demons myself. Big mistake, guys. 
The yes word started to creep into my mind about five or six months before I actioned it. Mentally, I was exhausted. Probably a combination of the study, business, and my obsession with going on a seven kilometer run every afternoon after work with my dogs. These runs helped me to process a lot of things, but the most important thing it did was prepare my body for the shitstorm I was about to wreak on it. I had started to clean out the house when the missus fucked off. Cleaning out cupboards filled with shit we never used or needed. Kids clothes from when they were babies. This woman had no bloody idea how to run a household. I am ashamed to say this, but this is when the tears started. Memories, emotion. God, it sucks to be a human sometimes. I cried, I cried the whole time I was doing this stuff. I have, I have this huge fucking house full to the brim with shit I no longer wanted or cared about, and I have to clean it out. The last few weeks were a haze that I barely remember, mostly mulling over the least painful way to leave this nightmare behind. I know some men choose to unalive their kids or the wife, and I can see the thought process, how they decide to do such a horrible, despicable thing. Maybe they see their families as their property and cannot allow it to be taken away by anyone except them. That is not me. I decided I was a problem. If I am gone, the nightmare is gone. I don't know how long it took me to prepare, but I must have spent a lot of energy on getting my business affair in order because I found out later that I had paid up all my bills, the employees got paid out, references made, and all holidays, etc. paid up. I even gave them instructions on how to wind up the work in progress. One Saturday night, after pulling down a large cubby house on my daughter's that I had built with my two hands and crying the whole time, I got absolutely shit-faced on Bundy. So guys, Bundy is rum. Dragged a petrol engine into my bedroom, started it, and went to sleep. I can remember at one point opening my eyes and seeing the smoke descending from the ceiling. I had one last coherent thought, which was, Fuck it, I am done. It was probably the Bundy talking. I can say that because I was... I can say, sorry, suicides don't really think through the results of their selfishness. I can say that because it was selfish. I was prepared to leave my kids without a dad, my parents without a son, my siblings without a brother. My kids have every reason to hold that against me. Anyway, it was my ex-wife to found me the next day. My cardiovascular fitness and overall toughness saved my life, but not without consequence. I also think the engine never rang long enough, as it only had a small tank. I spent a week in a coma, near kidney failure, near loss of my left leg and two months of rehabilitation. Carbon monoxide poisons the body as it replaces oxygen. The muscle produces toxins in response and septicemia sets in. While in the coma... The doctors basically told my family I was brain dead. No electrical response going on in my brain. So they started grieving pretty much straight away. I don't know what stuff I am made of, but after a week I opened my eyes and a nurse noticed that my eyes would follow her sometimes. She was a hottie. (laughs) They started to ask me questions about things that happened long ago, and I was responding. Old memories being recalled are a sign that the brain is okay. The estranged wife visited me a couple of times, pledged she would nurse me back to health, and got me to sign over and I had a sign over an account I had locked her out of. Nice hey. After this, my old man found out and went nuts. And the drugs started to make me delusional, so I refused to see her or take her calls. I started to think she would come back and cut my throat. Morphine is a bitch. A psychiatrist didn't diagnose me with any long term mental issues like bipolar or even depression. This is why I wanted to tell you this part of the story. You can be mentally healthy, but an event like this can turn you on, your, on turn you suicidal. It's nuts. The more I watch the red pill stuff about the way women manipulate men, the more ashamed I am of myself and my actions. My wife was just another woman. Millions of men, just like me, go through the same shit day after day. Some try to die and succeed. Some live like me. Others handle it as a man should. I am handicapped for life now. No more running for me, and for what? But luckily, my intelligence never faltered. I could be a drooling vegetable, a burden to my family, but I survived and I can tell you my story. I had to go through the divorce crap after I got better. My ex-wife didn't want to be divorced from me. She wanted me to keep running the business and paying her a wage. The nerve of this bitch. She wanted the gravy train to keep chugging along. The lawyers got fat and we got fucked. 
I lost any custody of my kids because the courts used my life attempt as proof I was a menace to society. I lost my guns, I lost many friends, I lost my business and my property. There was a silver lining though. Getting rid of all that material crap was like lifting a barbell off my shoulders. I have zero debt now and even though I'm still paying for my kids' university living on campus fees, I can live relatively cheaply. I've always been good with money. My body is destroyed so I cannot do the physical labour of my youth but I'm using my entrepreneurial skills to help others. I love teaching young guys trade skills and I'm teaching them about the trappings of women. Thanks to the online community pointing out the entitlement of modern women, I am much wiser. If I was in my 20s now, I'd probably despair, but having that knowledge might just have saved me from marrying the idiot I did. There will come a time where a man finally decides to give up women. It is liberating. I tried online dating a couple of years after my divorce and the pandemic. My small town isn't a very big pond and the fish are of low quality. I nailed a few monsters even with a handicap, so guys, it does work sometimes. Honestly, women over the age of 40 just do not do anything for this old dog anymore. Maybe the vasectomy was a good thing. Sex drive can be the overriding emotion of a young man. Believe me, I know. But the post-night clarity when you are with a monster really clears up your thoughts. I come home now after a 12-hour shift. Watch a bit of G-Man, have a shower, cook a feed, and set out on the deck with a Bundy and all of it in silence. No nagging. No justifying my existence to a selfish, material, obsessed, narcissistic bitch that only cares about money. Happy wife, happy life is for chumps. Happy wife equals a downtrodden doormat man. I am glad that I saw my life was going to end up like, even though I still couldn't let go after she left me. Longer way around, same result. G-Man, I know this is a long-winded story, but it has really helped me to put it in text and give you some perspective from another man that was nearly unalived by being in a failing marriage. I am thankful for my three kids. They are all smart like me, and I'm already imparting your wisdom on my two sons, 25 and 22. Good stuff, mate. My dad has been exposed to much to the ex. I just hope she doesn't wind up like her. Sorry, my daughter has been exposed to much of the ex's behavior. I just hope she doesn't end up like her. One thing I never mentioned was that my ex-mother-in-law is very much the same as her daughter. I noticed from very early on that she would belittle her husband in front of everybody. It was honestly fucking terrible behaviour and guess what? The daughters are all the same. They have no respect for their husbands. So she keeps him on anti-depression drugs and he's a shell of his former self. That would have been me at 55 or 60. My ex also gets married soon to that simp that she met at the school that I mentioned earlier. I pity that fool. That's the end of the story, guys. Thank you very much for writing that in. It must have taken a lot of effort to write that down. It was very articulated. And I think there are a lot of themes here that men will really resonate with. Guys, if you have any comments or similar experiences, put it in, um, put it in the chat, put it in the comments. And thank you very much for watching this far.